afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Randy Bell. I'm the director of the Global Energy Center here at the Atlantic Council. Thank you for joining us today for this discussion, assessing Democratic presidential candidates' climate and energy policies. I don't think this could be any more timely, uh, given that today is the first day that President Trump can formally begin withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. And a year ago, yester a year ago yesterday is the election. Uh, so we have a whole nother year of this. Um, uh, uh, President Trump's animosity towards climate policy is at least part of the reason climate change has become a top priority for Democratic candidates in the presidential race. Uh, it's also re the result of increased media coverage of climate-induced flooding and wildfires, uh, calls to action in the Green New Deal and the global climate strikes, and voter demands for candidates to formalize their climate and energy plans. Uh, the September Climate Town Hall was unprecedented in the seriousness that candidates and at least part of the electorate uh, had in addressing the issue. But the devil is in the details, and as the details emerge in various candidates' plans, a number of questions have emerged. To frack or not to frack, to nuke or not to nuke, uh, to tax or not to tax, uh, or to capture carbon or not, and the list goes on. Uh, so we have to, and we also have to ask ourselves what the implications of climate and energy policy is for the economy, for health, and for international relations. Uh, so fortunately, we've gathered, gathered a group of speakers from across the political spectrum who hold different stakes in these debates around climate and energy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we had Lauren Manas confirmed uh, from Sunrise Movement uh, to speak today. She uh, is a, uh, part of, she's a political and legislative coordinator for the Sunrise Movement. Um, she lost her voice and cannot be with us. Uh, so uh, we're sorry, that would have been another interesting voice here. Um, but with that, uh, I want to remind everyone that today's discussion is on the record, is streaming live, and will be archived on the Atlanta Council's YouTube channel. So don't say anything that your parents or your children would be embarrassed about. Uh, you can join the conversation on Twitter by following at AC Global Energy and using the hashtag AC Energy. Uh, we're hoping for a serious debate between people who are sincerely engaged on this topic, uh, but who do have different viewpoints. Uh, we hope some sparks will fly, uh, but, uh, and we're going to make sure that there's a Q&A portion at the end. We want to make sure that those are actual questions and not statements, so please be sure to ask a question. With that, uh, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Zach Coleman of Politico, to introduce the panelists and get the discussion started. Zach, please, the stage is yours. All right. Do I stand at this mic or I'm mic mic'd up already? Uh, so anyway, so uh, sit down. Getting stage direction live. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going to be moderating the panel here. We have Christy Goldfuss here from CAP, uh, Center for American Progress. We have Sarah Hunt from the Rainey Center. We have Charles Hernick from Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions. We have Amos Hochstein from the Atlantic Council. So we're just going to get right into it because I know that you all will have a lot of questions that I don't ask uh, and you're all smart people so I want to give you a chance too. So this is climate and in, in energy in 2020. So I'm going to start with Christy here to my left. Uh, the Green New Deal would require a massive build out of energy infrastructure. Now you used to be at uh, Center, or for the Council on Environmental Quality so I think you're pretty uh, game to answer this. Presidents from both parties have complained that permitting even for clean energy projects takes too long. So can candidates reasonably accomplish the Green New Deal's infrastructure goals with our current laws, and which candidates have a viable plan for dealing with these realities? Great. Uh, thank you, Zach. I mean, I, first of all, I just want to say, when you say the Green New Deal, it's sort of hard to know exactly what you're talking about. There's the resolution in uh, Congress, and then there's uh, Senator Sanders' plan. So, you know, I think we should should figure out which and be specific when we're talking about plans, who has a Green New Deal and which of these proposals. But I think your question about permitting and how are we going to achieve the really extraordinary goals that pretty much every single one of the major candidates on the left have laid out. What is consistent across all of their plans is an embrace of this concept of net zero by 2050 or carbon neutrality by the middle of the century, which is an extraordinary fast timeline. Uh, if you think about what we were looking at during the Obama administration and the mid-century strategy, we were talking about reducing carbon pollution and overall greenhouse gases by 80% by 2050. And that 20% is very significant, and especially looking at how do you get to the really 
uh, difficult to decarbonize sectors. So then how do we build all of this, which I think is your question related to permitting and how quickly we need to go. Uh, I think that is a secondary question and something that uh, will, the president will certainly need to address if we're going to achieve any of these goals. But it really is about funding the experts and funding the people who need to do this work and investing in the technology to make sure that the permitting process is as state of the art as it possibly can be. There is a federal permitting council that was stood up uh, under the Fast 41 Act several years ago that is staffed by the Trump administration uh, and does have a budget and will be able to collect fees from project proponents in order to make sure that their environmental reviews go quickly. But if you look at what's happened to the staff in the agencies that are responsible for conducting these reviews, they've pretty much been decimated. The folks are not there. The budget is not there to actually conduct the work. So when you place priorities, uh, as a president, you have to fund those priorities, and that will be the key to how quickly they can go. Well, with our current laws, though, I mean, you're talking about a massive build out of en energy infrastructure. Are the, the timelines and plans that are being proposed even realistic within our current framework? I would say it depends on which one you're talking about. They're not, I mean, they're not universally the same, and every single one of them is going to require a full approach uh, from an executive administrative standpoint and legislatively. What is the responsibility of Congress to help change any of these laws if we can't get there just through the existing structure we have right now? I'm going to move on to Amos here. Uh, candidates like Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris have said they would consider prosecuting fossil fuel companies for climate change. Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren have also called for a more aggressive DOJ. Uh, you know, as our lone representative from the in energy industry here, um, I'm wondering what you make of these calls and what kind of effect that might have on U.S. domestic producers, and, and you know, how are these pledges being perceived by industry? Thanks, Zach. Um, let me first, before I get to that, I just wanted to, to continue what you, Christy just talked about, which is, we're making a lot, we have to make a lot of assumptions. And I think when people run for president, um, they don't run with plans that are, they assume that they have the legislative authorities. They make the assumption that Congress will be on their side and that they will be able to pass that. That's not unique on climate change and it's not unique to this Democratic primary versus a Republican primary versus any election we've ever had. That's an assumption that's baked in, which of course it is fair to then challenge to say, will I have the legislative authorities and the legal authorities to be able to do these things and to change? So I think your question is right as far as if you assume today's, um, today's legislative reality or today's legal framework and regulatory framework, but then you're, if you're doing that, you're gonna be comparing apples and oranges because the you're assessing a plan that is based on a changed regulatory environment and a changed legal authority with a reality that is not. So just, I think it's, it's important to put that into that perspective. I think when it comes to your question, uh, I should probably start exactly with, <laughs> again, stating this is a democratic primary and uh, I think people are articulating a vision rather than a detailed plan of how do you get from point A to point B? How do you get there? I think that what Christy just talked about, changing the vision of what does 2050 look like, of what the goal of 2050 is, is, is more radical than it sounds and a lot harder to get there. Um, when, when you talk about the fossil fuel industry, I think that the energy sector as a whole is looking at the primary with a much more, um, through a lens that understands that this is a primary and would be more interested in seeing what the ultimate nominee uh, says uh, in that debate uh, with President Trump. And I suspect that it will be a, a nuanced approach compared to where the nominees are now. And I think that that doesn't matter if it's, uh, if it's uh, Senators Sanders or Warren or former Vice President Biden. I think that the conversation will be different because you're talking to different potential voters at that point. I think that the industry does not look at uh, these plans right now as necessarily realistic. Um, we've, we've gone through a change of how the industry views climate change from where it was just five years ago. It used to be you'd go to a fossil fuel energy conference 
and they would talk about these silly people talking about climate and how nice it is. They may grow from 1% to 5%, that that would be huge, but at the end of the day, it's 5%. You would get the numbers of, in 1980, uh, what was the ratio of oil in the energy mix, and it's exactly the same as it is you know, nearly 40 years later. Those were the favorite kind of talking points that you'd find at a conference. You'd go to the climate, more renewables and clean energy, and it would be 2050, we'll be there 2030. If we just keep it in the ground, the price will go up, everything is gonna be great. If we just had the right tax incentives, the technology will be there. That has changed a bit. I don't think it's changed as much in the clean energy side. I think it's changed a lot more in the, in the energy sector, uh, where you're seeing uh, fossil energy companies becoming huge investors in uh, the clean energy space, not, not led by the Americans, uh, led by, by European fossil energy companies. I think that they're viewing this debate in the primary as too early to really take seriously uh, and to see what happens later, and with a heavy dose of skepticism of whether or not these goals are actually achievable or attainable, and therefore, let's wait and see and none of this is, some of this is going to happen, most of this is not going to happen, and in the meantime, I need to diversify my portfolio. I'll end with just saying I think they care more about where shareholder pressure is coming rather than where the political uh, landscape in the Democratic primary is. All right, uh, I'm gonna move on to Sarah here. You've seen the numbers for Democratic candidates' climate pledges. We're talking trillions of dollars in federal, state, and private spending. What do you think about some of the federal spending levels envisioned in these plans? And what more can we do through the federal purse to encourage the kind of transition needed to address climate change? First of all, I'd like to thank Randy and the Atlantic Council for having me here today. I was an ELEAP fellow a few years ago, so I've been to a lot of these events. This is my first time speaking, so I'm very excited. In terms of the numbers, uh, I would you know, <laughs> echo what Christy said, there's not a lot of specifics in many of the plants. So it's a stab in the dark, best guess. I do think it's concerning to see these plans that are written as though they were written by no one involved in the process was, has ever tried to make a payroll, has ever sat around the kitchen table thinking about how are we gonna make ends meet. Uh, uh, you know, a tank of gas is a tank of gas. And for a long time, a lot of uh, middle class and low income American families are still going to need to afford to put gas in their cars. So I, I do find it interesting in the Democratic primary, we're having these conversations around climate plans that will strike at the heart of the very voters that they're trying to reach and their pocketbooks. And what I'd like to see, and I, I agree with what Amo said, this is a primary context. We are seeing Democrats who've developed these plans casting visions to appeal to their base. I don't begrudge them the chance to do that, but I hope that they're careful because eventually they're gonna be brute smacked with the reality of general election politics. And if they go too far, if they politicize the issue even more, you see it being wrapped around these conversations in terms of big spending, in terms of socialism, which, you know, legitimate or not, those criticisms do strike a certain fear in a certain part of the electorate. And I'd hate to see a Democratic nominee paint themselves into a corner in the primary and then have them have to walk back a bunch of it later because I care about climate change. I, as a conservative, I've been a climate policy advocate for five years. I have three nieces and a nephew. I don't want the world to be Mad Max for them and we need to have a serious national conversation about climate policy. I, I think we've also got to be realistic that no matter who is president in 2021, we need to be moving ahead in the energy space in a smart way, whether it's technology neutral tax credits for R&D, whether it's looking at some of the, the plans that, you know, Charles has worked on it more than I did, but we, uh, the, the Green Real Deal with uh, Representative Gates' office, looking at some of the things that you know, can be done that appeal uh, to people uh, on both sides of the aisle, because regardless of electoral politics, 
we need a plan that can win Republican votes in the House and Senate, even if you have, once again, as, as we did in Waxman-Markey age, a trifecta for the Democrats. I haven't forgotten that. We had a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic President, and we couldn't pass a big climate bill. So I hope that Democratic candidates and the party will start thinking very carefully about some of the low-hanging fruit we can go after. For ex one clear example of this from a plan, speaking of costing a lot of money, is uh, Senator Warren talks about electrifying the fleet in her plan, I think by 2035. Mm -hmm. That will be very expensive. And not every middle American, you know, mom in the Rust Belt who's trying to make ends meet can afford a new car. Uh, something that her plan doesn't really talk about is electrifying industry or industrial facilities. We could electrify ports. We, you know, very soon could electrify a large portion of the trucking industry. We can electrify manufacturing. You know, we can make sure that Amazon is running all of those nice little cranes in their distribution warehouses on, you know, electric uh, powered uh, vehicles. So those are things we can do that are low hanging fruit, that are easier, that are more affordable, that could be appropriately incentivized through federal policy. And I, I hope that um, both Democrats and Republicans will continue to talk about that. Can I build off of sure. what Sarah, I mean, there, so there are different investment yeah. numbers that range anywhere from one trillion to $16.3 trillion. So there's a wide range. I think what's happened with the Green New Deal coming onto the scene the way it has uh, in the past year is a shift in how people think about direct federal spending and who benefits as a result of that direct federal spending. And there are lots of ways, if you look at California or other states that have stepped up here, that we're going to have to invest in our infrastructure for this transition. And that's something that people can see in their communities now. So when we talk about appropriate incentives, what that looks like, I think in each sector it's gonna be a little different. When it comes to uh, Elizabeth Warren's plan, she has a green manufacturing plan that's all about industry. So I think she is very much looking at what are the appropriate incentives. Some of them are in favor of carbon taxes, others are not. Some are more heavy on regulation and some are a combination of approaches. But direct federal spending is now a part of the conversation in a way it certainly was not in 2016. You know, I, we're always going to have direct federal spending on some of these issues. Uh, I, I ha I've looked at some of the industrial plan from Senator Warren. It's not as robust as I would hope. You know, there's a lot of focus on individual people versus the easier things that we can do on a private sector industrial side. But what I would say, as a conservative, when we, this is my big concern, aside from the money and aside from how we're gonna afford it because someone's gonna pay for it and it's gonna be, it's gonna be the middle class, frankly, because they always end up paying for things. Um, I don't understand why in this age we are having conversations about expanding the power of a centralized federal government and its executive. In law school there was a phrase that I'm sure you all know, res ipsa loquitur, the thing that speaks for itself. So in terms of looking at who may or may not win the next election and what that means for national climate policy and I think we need to be talking, even Democrats should be talking more about what the states can do and what can be done you know, in the private sector, in public-private partnerships, because I'm very concerned about continuing to expand federal power, and the power of the purse is its biggest power. Let, let me uh, jump to uh, Charles on that, because uh, you know, I think he would like to address this as well. I mean, you know, Bernie Sanders has pr proposed a sort of green TVA uh, to expand renewable power. Mm -hmm. As Christy mentioned, um, Senator Warren has proposed uh, an industrial policy, a 10-year, uh, $1.5 trillion plan for green industrial mobilization. Yep. Um, I mean, why do you think we're seeing such interest in these big federal programs on the Democratic side of the aisle right now, um, in, in these interventions from Dem Democratic candidates, and how do these ideas sound outside the context of this process? Well, I think that the, the proposals that I'm seeing from the Democratic side are uh, big, big proposals, ambitious, include federal spending because these are the avenues that uh, many Democrats are, um, have, have been successful talking about and, and want to work on uh, in the near term. Um, thank you for the, the question, Zach, and before I get too far, thank you to Atlantic Council and, and Randy for including me in this uh, panel because this is a timely conversation. 
And one thing that concerns me about what's been said so far is the relax, it's a primary mantra. Um, we live in an era where we have the Green New Deal because an establishment Democrat was challenged in a primary and that Congresswoman went on to win and introduce a resolution and that's part of what's driving this. We live in an era where candidates and elected officials are being held to those campaign promises in an unprecedented way to the point that now President Donald Trump is, it, it, I don't understand how it surprises people, but because all of his promises in terms of what he's done and said were promises that he made to win the Republican primary and soundly defeat a dozen well-established uh, mainstream Republicans. So I think the relax, it's a primary, uh, it should be taken with a grain of sand because the politics of our era have changed it have changed when, uh, when Twitter and, and information can move so quickly. Uh, so those promises to, with an executive order, ban fracking or reduce the availability and, and ability to do that on public lands has dampened markets and has dampened enthusiasm ha and has raised questions about what is the, the proper U.S. role uh, in something like, like liquefied natural gas and, and where are those export markets um, going to be headed. The, the spending is a big uh, issue because I think the other thing that observers see is the way that some of the Democratic candidates are talking about climate solutions really upends the way that business has been done for over 100 years in the United States as it relates to the, the delivery and production of energy. States have primary authority over their energy mixes and any proposal asks to do something different is likely to see challenges by attorneys general across the United States. And so when we look at policies that are, ha have all of the eggs in one federal basket, we're gonna spend our way out of this, we need to be concerned about will this level of federal spending crowd in investment or crowd out investment in the energy sector? That's an important question. Will these federal policies uh, just get tied up in lawsuits, in which case this climate solution really isn't that actionable and that quick? Uh, because we're taking away power from states and taking away one of the primary avenues that we've seen emissions reductions in the United States because of federal tax credits and because of state action, renewable portfolio standards, clean energy standards, subsidies for however you want to look at it. Um, we can achieve these mid-century climate change goals, but only if we're fighting with both fists, the federal and the state. Let, if it's all me, up to the federal, then, then I think we've got some real challenges. I know Amos wanted to jump in on this one. Well, I don't think I'm in, I don't think I actually think relax it's a primary is a, is a policy goal. I just think that we, um, the question was more about how does industry look at it. I think industry is not gonna, uh, is not looking at it too carefully uh, as far as decisions for investments and so on. And I think from that perspective, yes, we are in a primary. I do believe that we will not see much change uh, in talking points, whoever, if, if uh, any of the candidate, once one of these candidates becomes the nominee, I don't think they'll walk back uh, any of the proposals that they are, right. uh, that they are presenting today. And I, I, I wanna make sure that that wasn't uh, misunderstood. I, I definitely believe whatever they're proposing today uh, will be their position in the general, in the general election and maybe even you know becoming more aggressive however there is a way of prioritization that will be that will the nuance will change in how this is addressed and that's that's normal for our policy but i believe that in the democratic party climate change has risen to be the top two maybe three but in many places number one issue uh, and defining issue of how people evaluate a candidate, and not just for president, but for, for any office. Um, the difference is that the, the nuance of what that means in different parts of the country. And I think you alluded to that, that these are largely state decisions. We have, we have a number of issues that these candidates, and you, you've raised one of them, and um, or in, the, in the opening we talked about fracking or no fracking and some of these issues. That is, goes to the heart of how we will have to balance uh, as a party and how the next president will have to balance. Some of these things can be done on executive order. And you touched on one of them. You can ban fracking on, 
on public land, on government land. But there's, there's very little fracking oh, on so I, federal right. lands. Yeah. So I was going to say, <laughs> you know, the Obama administration banned drilling, uh, not fracking, but drilling on, on federal lands, and it had almost no impact on... Uh, Wait, on what are you talking about? I'm saying for oil, I'm saying we we uh, pause on coal, right? Yeah, but not all fossil fuel. Not all fossil fuel, fuel but we even if if we're looking today at moving, if we would make any kind of executive order that would discuss these issues on federal lands, the impact on the actual fossil fuel industry would relatively be muted. uh, If you look at where most of the uh, most drilling is happening, it would have some impact. it will have a, I think, a greater impact on uh, exports, on people willing to trust whether or not you're starting to touch things like, are you going to ban LNG exports? Are you going to uh, re- reinstate the uh, the embargo on on crude oil exports that was uh, removed uh, during the Obama administration? These are big questions that are actually not in that some are discussing in the context of a Green New Deal, but I, I've seen many versions of what people believe a Green New Deal is, uh, to Christie's point. So I think these are where I think there'll be much more contentious uh, issues, and I think there'll be a lot of Democrats who will have some issues with, with some of these ideas, uh, and how they're discussed and how we move forward on those will have a great impact. When you start talking about electrifying, trying to electrify the fleet, uh, the, 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 uh, the automobile fleet and so on, I think that there's actually less argument about if that could be achieved, that would be great. Um, there's issues in make getting, getting to that point, uh, and I still, I haven't really seen a roadmap of how you get to a uh, fully electrified fleet in such a short period of time, but that's, you know, th- I don't think anybody is opposed to it, uh, especially not the Democratic Party, opposed to it as a, as a policy matter. But when you get to these other questions, I think that you'll see some, some broad disagreements on what does this mean and, and whether if in fact it actually has a positive or a negative impact on emissions and climate change and how fast we can get to the goals that we want to get to. Well then, e- even, even on fracking here, you have some division on, you know, you have Senators Warren and, and Sanders saying they want a national ban on fracking. You have Joe Biden saying, well, I don't even think that's Politically possible. I mean, you're talking about the state-federal spread here. Um, I mean, what what are the political implications of you making a statement like that if you're a Democrat to say I want to ban fracking? We're talking about moving to the general election at some point. Is that is that yeah. even warranted? Wanted? Like, do you is that a good idea to even state this right now? I think that uh, Democratic presidential candidates probably don't take a lot of advice from a Republican like me in terms of how <laughs> to win the election. Um, But Speaker Pelosi over the weekend was very specific and clear about this. Remember the Electoral College. Uh, Fracking, oil and gas are big industries in must-win states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan. I don't know how you win the Electoral College by promising to eliminate industries that have been major sources of personal income and tax revenue for municipalities. So don't take my word for it. I think that Speaker Pelosi has been uh, out on this issue and trying to advise candidates to uh, m- find different issues or a different approach to solving the climate change problem uh, in terms of something that is, that is actionable because you, you can't govern if you don't have the presidency uh, to enact some of these plans. Is what next? Okay. The Democratic nominee needs to be able to say to a Rust Belt mom, my climate policy will not take away your job. It won't take away your husband's job. My climate policy you know, will not make your life more expensive. And it's also going to help you know, make a clean environment for your kids. And so I, if, you, if, you ban, if you ban fracking, I'm, look, the analysis is all over the place, but my concern there, of course, would be we'd get a coal zombie. You know, <laughs> we, there's only so f- we can only build new utility scale wind farms so fast and frankly we don't have commercially scalable technology that's affordable right now to get us to 100 percent renewables by 2035 or 2050 even if we want to so we're going to have to do something in the meantime and natural gas is part of that the other thing that a fracking ban would do and this i, I don't understand i think it's irresponsible in the context of Frankly, the pressing national security concerns that we're looking at, um, even in the energy sector, 
because of the perspective and you know conduct of this president and this administration. You know, they don't think climate change is a serious problem, and yet climate change and energy are inherent to any discussion of our of our national security in this day and age. And fracking and American natural gas that we've gotten from fracking has you know, arguably really upended energy geopolitics. It's placed the U.S. in a much better position, and I don't think we can forget that either. And I want to get Christy involved in this. I mean, what, what do you think about the, the pledges that some of the candidates are making with regard to fracking? Well, before I speak to that, I just want to talk about the states for a second, because that really has been an extraordinary bright spot over the past several years. What we've seen with, uh, I mean, there are more, nine states plus D.C. and Puerto Rico have made some sort of binding targets that they have passed legislatively. So people had to vote. These weren't just executive orders that governors signed. Uh, to put in place plans to get to 100% clean, however it's defined, net zero, carbon neutral, however they put it in their legislation. So unlike uh, Waxman-Markey, where I think there was a lot of uh, angst and problems around how we were going to address the states, this is going to be front and center from the beginning of any democratic conversation because the states have come so far ahead and that needs to be protected. I mean, that's where the technology advancements are going to be made. That's where we're really going to be able to see what's possible at the state level. So I think that's a very exciting story and I would love to hear the candidates talk about it a little bit more because there was political re relevance there. In terms of the commitments, I mean, this is about a vision, a vision of what you want the country to look like. And yes, there are trade-offs in uh, how you talk about that vision, but um, that's where I think the candidates are weighing their own politics and looking at uh, what's the picture that they want to paint? So then, uh, jumping off of that, I mean, in 2016, Hillary Clinton said, you know, we want to put fossil fuel or coal workers out of business. I mean, that was a gaffe. She admitted to it. It was one of her. Yeah, I don't uh, think it was weak, phrased exactly yeah, right, that right. way. It was, the, it was that jobs were going to go. Paraphrasing. She didn't say what I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not Hillary Clinton. So, um, uh, but you know, uh, now Democrats to a T are talking about a just transition for fossil fuel workers. You have Bernie Sanders. He put out there. Uh, he pledged to guarantee workers' current salaries for five years and provide things like housing assistance and jobs retraining. Clinton did have a plan for transitioning fossil fuel workers, especially coal workers in Appalachia, uh, but she didn't win those votes, a lot of them. Um, so, I mean, can Democrats be honest with workers in fossil fuel dependent communities and still win their votes? Be honest about the future, be honest about what they want, and, and how can Democratic candidates demonstrate to people in those communities that they'll be taken care of? I think it's essential, and this is again a shift from 2016, that there is a serious conversation about where the transition happens and what it's going to look like. Again, I point to the states. I mean, Colorado, New Mexico, California, New York, all have very specific policy that points to working with people who lose their jobs as a result of this transition. There's a just transition office that was established in the Colorado legislation uh, that is going to work with workers as that transition happens. I think we have to look and see at the state level how does this policy play out. Uh, but we need to understand that we are addressing social and equity issues across this country in the entire political conversation we're having right now. And when we have this climate debate and talk about investing in communities and investing in workers and investing in the future that we want, that means there will be money, whether it's through a carbon free or whether it's through some combination of tax incentives or uh, direct spending. And how do you invest in the people who need that most? And how do you invest in the communities uh, that are going to be impacted in this transition first? We all agree that the infrastructure in this country needs attention and needs to be funded uh, in terms of rebuilding for the future. So that's got to be a key part of the discussion as we move forward. And people get jobs when we do that. <laughs> to where the real slam dunks are and potential for bipartisanship could be as it relates to dealing with climate change. Um, we do have a lot of infrastructure that is falling apart. There are 88,000 dams in the United States and only 3% of them provide electric power. Only 3%. So if we're really looking for all of the possible options to produce renewable power, hydropower should probably be one of them. Do half of those dams maybe need to be taken down to restore salmon corridors and you know provide some local environmental benefit? Sure. Then we're down to 44,000 dams 
that we could potentially be working from to generate jobs and electricity across the country. That's a big deal. And there are bills that are focused on reducing some of that red tape to make that more possible that have been introduced in the House and in the Senate. They just need enough political momentum to actually get passed. So my organization, Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions, we're firmly focused on what's that low-hanging fruit. We maintain a list. You can go to citizens4.com and check out some of these possible areas for bipartisanship where there are Republicans leading on this issue. Um, in terms of kicking open the door for additional investment uh, in renewables in particular, Sarah and I are, are co-authoring, and, and it should be published this week or, or next, November 8th. November 8th, an article that's focused on uh, kicking open the door for wind power, offshore wind. And wouldn't it be ironic and interesting if the environmental legacy of the Trump administration is the launch of offshore wind? Because what they're doing right now is although there was a delay with the Vineyard Wind Project off of Massachusetts, they're doing a comprehensive environmental review of the entire East Coast to try to make it so that they can fast track the future permits and hopefully green light a lot faster some of the other projects that are in the pipeline and could take advantage of that offshore federal land or federal waters, however, however it's defined. Um, the opportunities are there, but those are actions that we need to move on, uh, that, that we can move on from a federal standpoint. It doesn't give me a lot of confidence. And we have to remember that voters are super discerning and that they interface with their government too. And when you promise that Uncle Sam will take care of it and manage the electricity sector just as well and just as fast and just as efficiently as we get through the TSA checkpoints and as fast as I work through the DMV lines, it's not super encouraging. Uh, and so I think that we need to you know, remember that the, the federal play that Uncle Sam will take care of all of it, just trust us, uh, is going to be met with a lot of skepticism. So, let me, uh, Almas, you want to? Two quick One, I think to, to Christy's point, and to what Charles actually started this conversation, we do have to have a different kind of conversation about the transition that we've had before. I think the candidates are. I personally hope that we move away from guaranteeing jobs and guaranteeing money. I think that a worker doesn't want to replace his job with a check. Uh, he wants actually to go to work, uh, or she wants to go to work. And uh, that, the idea that, oh, but we'll have construction jobs not every coal miner says, oh great, I want to go work construction in, a st in four states over. Uh, so it's not a one-to-one. -one. We're going to have to have, you know, we, uh, there I would urge candidates to be a little less on the specifics and more on the guarantee that we take this plight of this transition very seriously and that we're not just simply going to say, but don't worry, there'll be construction jobs. Yeah. Uh, but rather take the dignity of that off of that job and understand that certain towns will be, will, if, if we don't have coal mining, those towns will look very different. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that the, this will be difficult for some. It can't paper over everything with, with money. Uh, some mm -hmm. of it will have to be very attention to detail of how do you get people back to work and offer the transition in jobs. The second, I w just want to urge a cautionary note that I think that uh, Sarah and Charles probably on this panel represent uh, most accurately, the majority of Republican voters, potentially. Uh, but I don't think it necessarily represents where Republicans have been in Washington, in Congress. Uh, so the idea of, of the bipartisan effort uh, still bewilders me, because I do believe if you look at the states, they're not just you know, blue states versus red states. Yeah. There's a lot of great stuff that's happening on renewable energy policy uh, and, and actual implementation in states that are run by Republican governors. Mm -hmm. Uh, but somehow in the states it's doable politically, in Washington it's not. So I, I'm still, I still think we have to adjust our expectations to some gridlock on, on some of these issues here in Washington. There's reason for optimism though. It, just last week, Minority Leader McCarthy said in the Examiner, essentially we're going to start losing elections as Republicans on climate change sooner rather than later. We need to be doing something about it. Mike Braun, United States Senator from a coal state, Indiana, is the co-founder of the Senate Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus. Representative Matt Gates, the Trumpiest congressman in Washington, I believe per his own um, PR people, he has a climate change bill. Dan Crenshaw, conservative representative from Texas, he has a climate change bill. I think that there's absolutely reason to think that we can have some of these conversations. Uh, or 
Oh, many of you know this. This is a sophisticated audience. 45Q is essentially a carbon price. It was passed. It was signed into law by this president. So there are things that can happen. Maybe they're smaller things. Uh, but you know, Republicans and Democrats can find things that they can agree on to do about climate. And there's a growing conversation on the right. You know, Charles and I being gainfully employed is a representative, a representative of that, too. So, so I think there's, there's more reason for optimism than almost might say. And well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to use the moderator discretion here. Uh, and, and being the paid skeptic, I'm going to switch uh, sides okay. here. And, and, uh, 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 but uh, so, uh, you know, Amos, I want to ask you, there was a point mentioned about uh, Trump's legacy. I mean, one of those is definitely he's upset the international order on trade. Uh, you know, at this point now, you also have Democratic candidates talking about how they would want to make trade a kind of climate smart, uh, uh, you know, way of doing things. So Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have talked about imposing a fee on imported carbon intensive goods. Joe Biden said he would fully integrate climate into trade agreements, take a hard line on China, and provide green debt relief to other nations. I I'm wondering what you make of these plans to better incorporate climate into trade and how that might be done. Well, I'm glad you asked that because I think one of the biggest um, gaps in most Democratic candidates' discussion on climate um, is that it's is the international piece. Mm -hmm. This has been a very U.S.-centric, U.S.-focused uh, discussion over the last couple of years. Uh, and I think that is a big mistake. We are, as a country, uh, equipped and we have the ability to make the proper investments, change in policy, to really bring about this transition and expedite the timelines that we had just talked about a few years ago, as we said earlier. But the international picture is not the same. And we have, we have a very patchy outlook when you look at the rest of the world. Uh, and let's, let's put Europe aside for a moment. Even there, there are patches of, you know, the coal patch in Europe is still very much alive. But let's put that aside. You know, people underestimate the achievement of President Obama being able to bring China and India along and how hard that was. Today, it's just seen, oh yeah, they were part of, the, of Paris. Uh, that almost didn't happen. It was very hard. And I think it's going to con early, which yes, spurred which everybody else allowed us to make to, to for Paris to happen. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's easy to move forward. Uh, and if you look at what's happening around the world, there are new coal plants being built. You know, Charles and I we talked about this earlier. In the U.S., it's hard to imagine a coal fire mm. power plant being built. Uh, it's not. You don't have to imagine. You can just go visit the s construction sites in many countries, right. in Southeast Asia, in China. Uh, you can look in uh, other parts of the world where we're going. So we have a real gap in, on climate, and we're s we've become so focused in the United States that we forget where we're going. And if we, I, I don't think it's only about putting penalties of tariffs on, you know, I think it's using the same, the same uh, tool that I, I don't like President Trump using, and we're using it in the same way. We have to go back to seeing how do we change the, what the requirements are to get to a transition internationally. And the reality is that the cost of finance and the cost of money for renewable energy and clean technology, it is not the same as in the US where it's available and relatively cheap. It is either expensive or entirely unavailable. Uh, finance needs credit, needs, uh, needs a variety of factors that are there. We can work on these. But it's going to take a lot of work by the international community, a rechanging of some of the priorities, uh, even the World Bank and IMF, where we've already done some of this. It's going to have to be different than what we did in 2014, 2015. We're, there's a lot of gaps there. I think trade is a good tool to do that. Uh, but it's not, again, we put everything on, on into one bucket. It's going to be a lot more. We're going to have to, the next president, if they want to tackle uh, climate change seriously, we'll have to move from a U.S. Green New Deal to look at this again from an international perspective, a global perspective of how do we work together and what do we do as the United States in order to make it uh, faster, cheaper, and more available to, for countries to make those investments and move away. And I'll end with one point. When you spend a few billion dollars on infrastructure in any country, you are married to that for a very long time because it's very it, it changes the, 
the economics of a competing infrastructure project because you just made it much more expensive because you have to now assume loss on what you've just invested in, whether it's a pipeline, a power plant, whatever it is. So the sooner we get to investing in the international side and having that discussion, uh, the better we will be able to project a forecast for a cleaner environment in the future. And it can be, the international space has always struck me that it can be billions, not trillions, when we're talking about how making an investment that has a real impact. But sometimes it's not actually giving money. It is, working, it is yeah. working to understand what is holding banks back from making an investment in renewable energy in a certain country. And, and we did that. We had the, uh, the Clean Energy Finance Task Force between the US and India, uh, which there was a problem. India, no private institution was willing to finance any renewable project in India in 2015. Yeah. It was all multilateral international financial institutions. It was all you know the AID types in, in multiple countries, World Bank, IFC, but no bank was willing to do it because the legal structures weren't there. So sometimes it's not even just about spending. It's about thinking and prioritizing this issue and saying the US government will spend its efforts to bring in the expertise from the United States, the expertise from other countries, from other institutions to say, what's the gap? What's holding back the investment? How do we bring a, uh, a peak coal demand from 2028 to 2024 or from 2035 to 2030? And that will also require some reality of we're not gonna have the same benchmarks and targets as we have in the United States. It's okay to say that those will take a little bit longer because we're climbing uphill. The needs of the world are great in terms of energy. And we talked about equity and just transition here. Again, the needs of the world are great. There are people who will die in India because they don't have a window air conditioner. But there are, there are people who die in this country because their electricity gets turned off. At several, I think three or four in Arizona within the last year. Um, and that's just to start. Before you look at the other externalities associated with um, the lack of energy. And that's where we have to think of this as an opportunity. You know, Paris does consider that the needs of the world are great, that we do need to deliver power for quality of life to save lives. And if we, as the United States, can step up and take a leadership role in fossil, because these coal plants, hundreds and hundreds of them are going to be built. If we can see an opportunity to accelerate our research and development in clean fossil tech, uh, net power, I believe, is very close to locating a zero emissions coal-fired demonstration facility for electricity generation. We can dream big. Are there other externalities associated with coal mining that are concerning? Yes. But if we sit here and say, okay, we've, our goal is to get to net zero as quickly as possible as a globe, we've got to be looking at fossil clean tech. And as a country, there's a huge economic opportunity if we prioritize research and development in those areas you know, yeah, that we can take to the rest of the since, world. Since you mentioned externalities and, and research, uh, let me just jump on to nuclear power real quick. Mm -hmm. Uh, because there's actually some interesting divisions on the Democratic side of the aisle here um, in, in the 2020 race. I mean, you have Biden and Booker backing more renewable power. You have Sanders and Warren opposing it. Um, you know, it's the largest, nuclear more nuclear, nuclear, yeah. Um, you know, it's the largest source of carbon-free energy in the U.S. Um, you know, what, what are, are there actually any good ideas that the 2020 candidates have surfaced for expanding or nuclear power or, or, you know, what, what do you I see? Think the, the openness to keeping nuclear as the nuclear option, that keeping nuclear as an option is of vital importance and can't be understated. If we're really going to solve the climate change problem, it's going to be because we increased all of the possible options mm -hmm. to implement and develop low emissions or zero emissions technology, and we did everything that we could to reduce the costs, not just in the United States but globally so that we can export and sell some of these technologies internationally. And, and to stay on nuclear for just a second, the transaction cost associated with siting a new nuclear facility in the United States is triumphant. There was a bill that passed last year that uh, will hopefully make it more uh, readily available or easy to do an experimental uh, test pilot with a small modular reactor 
on Department of Energy land, that's a good step forward. But it's still far from being able to implement small modular reactors that would be the size of this room and something that you could easily put on a cargo ship and deploy to another country to help respond in a natural disaster scenario. Um, these are the types of technologies that we at a minimum need to be open to. And one thing that we've seen over the past couple of years is the Department of Energy budget increased by 25% on a bipartisan basis. And that's something that, is, that really does matter in terms of planting the seeds for innovation to see this launch in the long run. We need the regulatory framework to be revised so that we can actually develop some of these projects in our own country. Otherwise, we have to travel to other countries, United Arab Emirates, uh, places, uh, you know, other places in the Middle East uh, to see this. Or the alternative is if we walk away from the nuclear industry, we run the risk of foreclosing on another important option. And we run the risk of ceding valuable territory to the Russians who are running around and signing contracts in Africa to develop nuclear power plants because they need lots of but power. Is, is, there, is there a Democrat, anyone here, who has actually um, proposed ideas that would help bring down those costs and make this more of a reality, more nuclear power? Senator Booker has talked about it. Yeah. I'll be frank, I haven't seen anything robust, which I may have missed something, come out of his, um, out of his campaign. He is a co-sponsor of um, the Nuclear Energy Leadership Act in the Senate with the Senator Murkowski, which is, you know, about, you know, looks at things like NRC realignment to streamline permitting, for example, uh, and, you know, other things we need to do to invest in uh, nuclear power in this country uh, as the big sister of a nuclear engineer and someone being from New Mexico, the birthplace of the atomic era. I, I'm, I'm all about it. I think on SMRs, too, uh, in terms of non-proliferation, we've done some research looking at, you know, whether or not with you can move them around. So can we put them on U.S. military bases abroad and use them to help provide power to folks there, so that we can deploy zero carbon power with fewer non-proliferation concerns? And I would much rather, you know, us be doing that in in <laughs> in uh, Nigeria, for example, sure. than than Putin, frankly. Yeah. And I think the importance now is that question of whether or not the candidates are looking at a full portfolio approach of how we address climate change and whether or not nuclear is part of that. The Center for American Progress, John Podesta and myself and several other members of the climate team put out a report that charts how do we get to 100% clean future by mid-century. And it's not possible if we lose the existing nuclear fleet because it'll be replaced with natural gas. And then, of course, we'll end up increasing emissions even greater. So I understand that there are uh, deep fears, deep concerns, and a legacy uh, that has really led to not a lot of popular support for nuclear energy. So if a candidate is going to be supportive of these options, they're gonna have to make the case to the American public and show that it's safe and that we can do something about the waste. Speaking of things that might or might not be popular, um, so several candidates like Pete Buttigieg and Joe Biden have offered there's a role for a carbon tax. Uh, but some of the political left seems to have moved beyond it, thinking it's too small to actually address climate change. And economists would say the same for a lot of where these proposals are starting out. Um, and the political right has obviously been skittish about it. Um, I mean, is there a world in which you can see a carbon price becoming politically feasible in time? Not at the level you would need to get to these scientific targets. I mean, uh, the IMF report that just came out recently was looking at still a two degree target. Uh, and that was, they were still talking about 75 to $100 per ton tax, which I don't think anyone on the Hill thinks is a, a viable path, even with Republicans open to a carbon tax. Uh, and we've seen political challenges in Australia and even uh, Washington State tried to pass it via ballot initiative twice and get it through the legislature, was unsuccessful, and then Governor Inslee moved forward on his 100% clean power bill and got it through in one uh, legislative session. So I, I think the carbon tax is still incredibly important because there's no way the American public is not going to recognize that polluters are going to have to pay some more for the pollution that they put out and that that money will be important for rebuilding infrastructure and rebuilding and investing in communities. It's just the size of it uh, is going to be a big question in what comes along. It's no longer seen as the silver bullet that's going to solve everything. But there's a difference between saying it's not a silver bullet and not saying that it's part of the, of right. the story. Definitely. I, was, I think the question, I think there's no question that it's not 
the sin qua non, but it, I, I think there is openness in the political spectrum. Definitely. And because Republicans have come a long way on the Hill to being willing to vote on, mm -hmm. on a carbon tax, it, it, it could be something that grows and the, the, the rate of the tax could also rise as we, uh, you know, as time goes by and it becomes an important piece of just changing the psyche in America for polluters to pay for the pollution they put out. I mean, we have some real, I think, things that we can do right away that we're not talking about because you can't, on the left, you can't talk about the fossil fuel industry as surviving um, at all, and therefore you can't put any priorities or methods that will make it um, cleaner in a shorter run. And on the right, you can't go after the fossil fuel industry for a different reason. So what we are left with is the fact that we are our flaring in the United States is growing so much. And while we're having this debate, we've went from number eight to number six to number five to number four, according to the UN, and now probably number two or three, if you look at real data versus just what reported. But if you just look at what companies are reporting, uh, we have now, we're the behind, I think it's Russia, Iran, Iraq, and then the United States. But with the sanctions on Iran's oil production, uh, we're probably already number three. And I forget where it was, but one of the universities did a study on believing that only 50% of flaring is being reported. So we have taken all the advancement that we had on reducing emissions and we're reversing it because of flaring, but nobody can actually talk about charging any money for it or, or making it or banning it. Because if you ban the flaring or address the flaring from the left that says, no, no you can't do that because all production has to go away. So, and on the right, you can't do it for, because you can't touch production, because it could have an effect on production. But in the meantime, the Permian is growing at a million mm -hmm. barrels a day increase in production while we're having this conversation. So oil's not going away anytime soon. And the amount of flaring that's happening there is beyond belief. If you look at the Google Earth at night, it, is, it looks like a city mm -hmm. and nobody lives there. It's just all lit up. And so, so we have these weird gaps here that while we talk about should we do a carbon tax, we're, we're, we have you know, low-hanging fruit that nobody wants to talk about or touch, even though they'll have a greater impact than anything else we're doing. And by the time the next president comes in, this problem is going to be far worse than where we are today. And, and that's where, in, in my mind, the juice just isn't worth, worth the squeeze when it comes to a carbon tax and the, the political maneuvering that would have to be done for that. Uh, there's, not, there's, there's no consensus, number one, on what the federal tax or price for carbon should be. And then there's even greater disagreement within the left and within the right on what to do with the revenue. Do we decrease taxes? Do we do just transition? Do we do something else? Do we invest in, in infrastructure or all of that stuff? That's like both parties. Yeah, or do we both just give it back in, in dividends? And, and that's where it's like both parties agreeing that you know, we need to fix the health care problem. And we've seen how easy that is. It's, it's a similar, similar process and problem with a carbon tax, but I think that we can be smarter about it. Because what we're talking about with a carbon tax is not, uh, we're talking about sending a signal to the marketplace. And the federal government can do that in one way, and states can do that in a different way. Carbon pricing already does exist. Sarah talked about the 45Q tax credit, which is a federal price that values and monetizes the sequestration of carbon dioxide if you put it underground and keep it there forever. That's worth something. That's worth something for long-term planners and folk, for folks who want to continue to develop oil and gas, but make it someday an option, and this is for Occidental Petroleum, where they are, they're interested in, in the option where a customer who needs to fuel their gas-powered car can pick between the gas station on the left and the gas station on the right. And if the gas station on the left offers you net zero emissions gasoline because they sequestered enough carbon dioxide on the front end so that what you burn at the end of your tailpipe doesn't count in the positive, um, what are you going to pick? The gas station on the left or the gas station on the right? We have increasing opportunities to uh, implement and make that technology real. Also, that a carbon price doesn't exist in the United States just isn't true one-third of the United States economy is governed under a carbon tax or a carbon price under a cap-and-trade system offered at the state level. California Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, mm -hmm. which is looking to expand and get Pennsylvania in for the first time and have New Jersey come back in. 
So those are big states, and those are meaningful policy plays in terms of what's happening at the state level. And I would offer that that's a better way to work the system, to so have the federal government focus on reducing costs, have states increase the cost at the pump, because that's politically challenging. Let, let me uh, just tr transition. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Zach. Uh, yeah, I think direct carbon pricing is, is kind of nice, like unicorns. And my purple hair is 100% natural. I was born this way. There are economists crying yes. everywhere, as you say. There, there. I mean, it's beautiful, but you know, since when is politics beautiful? I will say this, as Charles alluded, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, something that we've been working on at the Rainey Center is putting together a framework for a program similar to the offshore oil spill liability trust fund, where voluntarily companies or actors that believe they could have liability related to their greenhouse gas emissions. You could pay in at a level you know, set by actuaries, have a panel decide you know, when damages related to climate change have occurred. You know, are we moving the Isla Sandajan Indian tribe because of climate change? What percentage of the PG&E fires can we attribute to being exacerbated by climate change? The, the idea being that fund would then pay out and the actors who might be liable would then have their tort liability capped. You know, that's a different kind of a price on carbon, a different kind of market signal that acknowledges the potential liability for harm, and set, you know, but also acknowledges the fact that we're all carbon emitters, that these companies, frankly, responded to consumer demand uh, for their product, fossil energy, and allows us to move forward and address the costs of dealing with climate change without bailing out these big, you know, major greenhouse gas emitters. I think that for me is the big thing missing from the Green New Deal and some of the conversations that Democrats are having. I'm a conservative. I believe in personal responsibility. I believe in accountability. I've certainly been held to it in my own life and I, I don't really want to see a carbon bailout. Some of these major emitters have been you know, polluting the atmosphere, putting trash in all our yards essentially for a long time when they knew better. And we need to find a pathway that allows them to decrease their liability, to help pay for the seawall, for example, uh, and uh, make the rest of us whole. Now, let me, uh, you know, since healthcare was mentioned, um, you know, we know that was a very big, big lift. Um, and you know, you, you get to a point where if you have a new president come in, you only have so much time to push game-changing legislation. Yeah. A lot of the proposals Democrats have pushed are huge on climate and environment. But the question is, will that be the first thing out of the gate? Let me get a sense of the panel here. Does anyone think that any of the 2020 Democrats running, that this is going to be their top priority, their, their Obamacare-type push, uh, if you've only got one shot kind of thing, are they going to use it on climate change? The question is, do we, th are, are, we are, are you phrasing yeah. this in the, in the I, positive or the negative? You think they're not do, going do, to. Do you think they are going to? <laughs> do I think they are going to? Uh, I think based on what Amos was talking about just a little bit ago, we've been doing uh, a lot of polling in early states and in those battleground states. And for the first time in all the polling that we've ever done, we see climate change right there with health care and then in some cases even being more important to Democrats. Um, so I think it's impossible to imagine, especially given the plans that they put forward, that any of them would not make this part of their original 100-day out-of-the-gate plan. Now, there's a wide range of what that looks like, and for those of us who had been in the administration, how does that translate into every bilateral conversation? Do you set up a commission or a new part of the White House? What does it mean to use every single lever of your power from the very beginning when your political capital is highest? And I, I think that's where folks are trying to push for, A, commitments around, will this be a top priority for you? Yes. B, how does it fit with the overall narrative that we're hearing from these candidates and the social change that they're really trying to push? And I, think the, I agree with every word. It'll depend on what the Congress looks like mm -hmm. in this election. Yeah. Um, if you have the Congress that we have today, Democrats controlling the House, Republicans controlling the Senate, that will change what the agenda is. It is a legislative agenda 
which I think will be diminished if we are in the reality that we're in today? Or is it more of putting together, okay, what can I do as president in the first 100 days that doesn't actually get me bogged down in a, in a uh, sort of quagmire on the hill between the House and Senate? Uh, I'll try still to get something done there, but I think there'll be a bigger effort on what do I do with the executive powers that I have to make as big an impact as I can in those first 100 days. I think the next president, whether it is a Democrat or a Republican who succeeds Trump, is going to be facing a very big foreign affairs and national security problem. We've got in the energy context, for example, it, this blows my mind. I haven't fully processed it yet, but apparently the United States of America, you know, the beacon to the world on human rights, is now willing to send U.S. troops to protect oil fields in Saudi Arabia and Syria, but not to prevent genocidal aggression against the Kurds. It's pr or simply look, if we want to talk about moving ahead in the international space, our credibility after Kyoto, after Paris, uh, Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Um, those, those are, goodness gracious, even Burisma is a natural, natural gas company. So I think the next president, whomever they are, whomever it is that succeeds Trump from either party, is going to have to spend a lot of their time, energy, and capital on addressing that situation. You know, as a conservative, as someone who's worked for many Republicans, you know, that's what I'm most concerned about. And I'm very concerned about the fact that, you know, the Democratic Party nor, the, nor Trump are talking about how climate and energy really are playing into all of these headlines on energy mm -hmm. that we are seeing right now. All right, we're going to open it up to Q&A now. We've got one right here. Hello, I'm Rob Richards with the Atlantic Council. Um, Christy, you just mentioned... I'm Bronco Terzic with the Atlantic Council. Christy, you mentioned a poll. Uh, back in February of this year, the Pew Trust issued their uh, public policy priorities poll, and climate change was number 17 out of 18. Uh, the first was economy, health, education, terrorism, and Social Security, the top five. Has anything changed since February? Uh, you well, know, is it the California fires, or, or is it possible that climate change will not be a major issue between the Republican and Democrat candidate in the major election? So a couple of things. Our poll was also earlier this year, so I think it was either February or March, and uh, it was Democratic primary voters, which are very different than obviously the overall general electric, which, general electorate, which Pew looks at. Um, and then the second part, I just lost. What was the second part of your question? Oh, has anything changed? Yeah. Um, I think we're seeing the intensity around climate change and the need to act because of, you think about where we were a year ago. We had California fires again. We had an election. We had the IPCC report that came out and the National Climate Assessment report that came out on the Friday after Thanksgiving when the administration tried to bury it. And then we had sit-ins in uh, soon-to-be Speaker Pelosi's office that launched the Green New Deal. That was just a year ago. So the speed at which we are seeing this change happen in um, the public's <coughs> mind, I think is quite swift, but it is still a challenge. Uh, when we get into the general election, this will be an issue because politics is about friction. And the fact that President Trump has already stated, hey folks, we're not gonna talk about the Green New Deal right now because we're gonna wait until the general election so we can scare the hell out of everybody with this. He's already articulated and said the quiet parts of his strategy out loud for the general election on climate. We know what's coming. We saw what happened in Australia where language there in that election was about scaring people and scaring them about their pocketbook. On the other side, we have this newfound intensity on the Democratic uh, voter side that really feels like we have to address this issue. And if you think suburban women of uh, different stripes are what are really going to be in play here, climate change is an issue that moves them. So this is going to be a fight because the differences between the likely candidates, whoever they end up being on the left, are so big. Versus in 2008, Barack Obama and McCain, they had plans that were not entirely different. So I do expect this to be a big part of the fight. If you want an example of why Democrats want this fight, 
Look at this stage. I mean, what you hear from Sarah just now is why Democrats want this on uh, this debate, because they believe that the independents and, and traditionally Republican voting who are open-minded about voting something else for the first time on this issue agree more with Democrats than with Republicans, depending on who ultimately the nominee is and you know all those things. Let's uh, go over here. Yeah, Hi. murderer's row over here. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joel Yutkin. I'm with the High Road Strategies, also with the U.S. Association for Energy Economics, I should add. Um, the, uh, I'm not finding this particularly illuminating yet because I think nobody has, none of this is crystallized. I think my, I'm a, I'm, I'm a de-leaning and I come out of labor. So I've worked a lot in the space relating especially to uh, how this might affect the heartland kind of communities and so on. I think I'm glad that some my Republican friends there seem to be at least open-minded about climate. I wish the Republican Party might actually take seriously that climate change is an existential issue and, and therefore needs a across-the-board gov government, private sector, civil sector, states, uh, you know, commitment to this thing and not worry about whether the federal government is going to come in and, and you know, land black helicopters and take over everything, because I think that's absurd. But anyway, um, I wanted to point this to Christie, because to what extent do the Democrats' candidates, they talk about just transition. I've worked on the issue of just transition myself. I think the Dems are a mile wide and an inch deep on mm -hmm. this stuff. To what extent are you think they, uh, they're ready to to be more realistic about what this implies, especially if they do want to win the Heartlands, because I don't think unless they face this, they will win the Heartland. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want to kind of get more in the sense of your cap, and I know yep. you're looking a lot at this stuff. Yes, uh, I mean, the IPCC report talked about, oh, we can do this transition, but if we do it, it will be at the scale that has never been seen in human history. So I think the discussion around just transition, I know there's lots of um, uh, folks who don't even like that term. So worker-centered transition, however we talk about this. Uh, I think we have to look to the North. Canada has put together an actual proposal where they will be going to communities to talk about what does it mean to help you as you transition away from fossil fuel. We're not gonna be able to, I think I agree with Amos, put all the details in without working with the communities that are gonna be most impacted by this transition. So I think there is a serious attention on it, but as you said, the details are not there and it is going to require whatever big government-wide effort to work with those communities to figure out how we address this appropriately. Because I, I don't think there are a ton of places that we can point to. We can look at BRAC realignment. We can look at you know, other places where we have successfully closed down large nuclear plants and been able to put people into jobs. But that's we have to start picking up those um, full government-wide approaches that were done right and what worked and then go to the people who are going to be impacted and find out how to learn from them. You looked at the Blue Green Alliance. Yes, and we're, we work very closely with them on, uh, they have a whole platform on um, the solidarity for climate action. And, and, and just to, to build off that a little bit though, um, when it comes to just transition, we have very few successful federal models and I think, in fact, the evidence indicates that the federal government is pretty lousy at just transition, and that's why Donald Trump is president, because he hammered hard on NAFTA being an, a, one where you know the economists agreed this was going to lead to overall uh, improvement in quality of life for most Americans, and that was true, but there, wasn't at, there weren't adequate mechanisms for the winners to compensate the losers, and so we ended up in a situation where I, as a free trader, hated that part of the president's platform that we needed to renegotiate NAFTA. But at the end of the day, those modest improvements to focus more on labor, focus more on environment, and bring those into the fold have been improvements that I have to accept. And I think that that's one where uh, the, the question and the efficacy of the federal government in that position raises a lot of questions in my mind. Yeah, actually, there are We're going to move on to another question here. Uh, we have over here. 
Yeah, you mentioned carbon taxes, and you're saying it's going after the polluters, but just like any business that suffers under the overreach of the government, whether it's overregulation or taxes, passes on to the consumer, and isn't this going to affect basically the middle class or even poor people who yeah. have to pay for their energy? And also the call for having these electric cars. I mean, what generates electricity? Isn't that fossil fuel? And why is it always developed nations? Like the U.S., we do a lot of stuff to try to, to make our energy production cleaner, but nobody talks about China or India, which pollutes the hell out of the atmosphere. There's a lot in there. There's a, there's <laughs> a lot in there. Start? There's a lot there's in there, but I shouldn't question asking. To just support it. Uh, expand a little bit on the carbon tax component. So let's say that I'm wrong, and let's say that a carbon tax passes with, with flying colors you know, right, in, right away in the next session. What happens when the economy slows down? Those subsidies, those tax cuts, that money that was sprinkled in terms of dividends or however it comes back to the American taxpayer, that will be popular. But that carbon tax increase that affects everyone at the pump will not. And there's no, talking about historical precedence, there's no evidence that folks support an increase in their transportation costs Look at Chile, where they just had to move the United Nations Conference of Parties because of a boost in transportation costs. Americans are historically non-responsive to increases in gasoline costs, and that's why the gas tax hasn't increased in well over a decade. Um, so I think that that's something where there's no substitution when it comes to gasoline, and people are very sensitive uh, to gasoline price changes. And so that's why, even if I'm dead wrong, I'm concerned that that as a climate policy won't be recession proof. Is there anyone in the center? Let's go back here in the red. Hi, um, I'm wondering what you all think about a national performance standard, renewable or technology inclusive, and also sector specific standards. I think this is uh, we're one of the places that we're seeing more emerging consensus around a clean energy standard or some way to focus on where we need to go with the good types of technology, uh, which is why we've seen so much success at the state level. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth about it here in DC because it has to be 60 votes versus a carbon tax, which you could easily see getting through any kind of budget reconciliation package. So uh, from our perspective at CAP, a clean energy standard uh, is one of the ways that we think we can get a lot more buy-in. And we've seen at the state level, people focus on the good news rather than the bad news of how much more you have to pay. I think from my perspective, if you're going to have a national performance standard, making it technology neutral is very important to getting that Republican buy-in. You know, there are several Republican senators that I can think of that you know, might be open to that conversation if it were a technology neutral conversation. And from a regulatory perspective, I'm, I'm a bit of a Clean Air Act nerd. And one of the problems that wind and solar had breaking into the market early on was that the original Clean Air Act was very much technology based versus standard and performance based. Mm -hmm. So then you have to go in and change the law or change the rigs just to bring your new energy innovation to market. So I think it's very important in terms of incentivizing energy technology, clean tech R&D, that we, if we do something, if we say, hey, we want to get to 100% net zero or whatever other standard we set, that it allows for innovators to look and say, all right, I might have a market. I'm not going to have to go and change the law after millions of dollars in investments and even permitting to be able to bring this product, this energy innovation technology, this new innovative energy technology to market. You know, I think probably the solutions that we're looking for, you know, th they might not have been invented yet. There might be a seven year old out there right now in, in Colorado or Minnesota who's going to, who's gonna save the world with whatever they come up with. And we need to have policies in place that don't arbitrarily favor technologies versus outcomes. And, uh Another question we got right up here, fourth row. Thank you. Hi, Kayvon from the Canadian Embassy. I have two questions that are slightly related. The first of, have any of the Democratic candidates expressed their vision for renewable infrastructure being either ahead of the meter or behind the, the meter? And the second is, 
as the U.S. continues to enhance and, and roll out its transmission grids, uh, allowing for the electrification of both refinement and extraction of natural gas, is it still on the table to export natural gas to developing nations because of its portability where it's not really viable to build out large-scale uh, electric infrastructure to your point that we need to tackle this as a global issue, not just a domestic issue? Take the natural gas one. Go ahead. Uh, on the natural gas, I think that we are, I, I don't see a move to uh, change the, the environment as far as the export licenses that have already been given. Uh, what you could have, uh, theoretically speaking, is someone that comes in and tries to uh, slow down or, um, or not permit new uh, export facilities. Uh, if Once we get out of a campaign mode and we get into a governing mode and you look at the role that LNG plays uh, in the rest of the world, forget about the United States for a second, but the role the gas plays in the transition uh, I don't see the, U the U.S. moving away from that, both for national security implications, foreign policy reasons, because that's where you get to this mix of some of its climate policy, some of its foreign policy. Uh, we're not going to take that off the table. If we did, the price of natural gas as the United States is going to be somewhere in the 25, 28 percent of the LNG market at that point. You'll have a huge spike in natural gas prices, and all that that will translate to is moving peak coal uh, much further away into the future. So from both a foreign policy perspective and a climate perspective, I don't see that changing. It could mean that you're not going to see additional permits f through FERC for additional LNG plants that have not yet uh, been permitted. On the specific question around net metering and the candidates, I, I think it shows up mostly in terms of community choice and individual choice on how you access your energy. And the specifics, I, I can't think of any of the specific elements of a plan right this second. But I think that will continue to be what's driving, I mean, in New Mexico or Salt, Salt Lake City, Utah, they are allowing customers to choose. You have to opt into getting coal. You're going to get 100% renewables. If you want coal, you would have to, on your actual uh, utility bill, say that you want your electricity from coal. So I think we will see unique ways um, to address this and give communities a voice in the type of electricity they get. We don't make that decision now, but does that leave us vulnerable to bunch of stranded assets? That's the entire natural gas conversation, yes. I mean, the, the yes. And that's uh, all we have time for today. So I want to thank, one, the Atlantic Council for hosting this, and then also the panelists for being able to be here and give them, give us their thoughts. So thank you. <laughs>